Hello and welcome to this week's episode of everyone's favourite science show, Everyone's. Starting off the news this week, some very interesting research has been published in Earth and Planetary Science Letters that has revealed new evidence that Earth sported a planetary ring just half a billion years ago. It has previously been known that during this period there was a time of high intensity meteorite strikes. In analysing the impact craters from this period, researchers found out that there was a much, much higher frequency of impacts along the equator and close to it. This led to the idea that a particularly large asteroid passed close enough to Earth for our planet's tidal forces to break it apart and pull the remaining debris into orbit to form a ring. The researchers also commented on how this would go some way to explain the particularly extreme cooling that Earth experienced during the Ordovician time period as it cast a shadow across the planet. This is, of course, a really exciting discovery and could have a really big impact on the way we think about how external events have shaped this planet's climate and geology. It has been suggested that Earth could have had rings before, such as when the giant Mars-sized object called Theia collided with Earth in an event that eventually created the Moon. This was a very long time before this new evidence suggests, however, where we're looking at is about 466 million years ago. Speaking of moons, in other news for this week, we're going to have what has been dubbed a mini-moon for 53 days from the 29th of September. The astronomical object in question is a small asteroid that had previously been checked to make sure it was not on a collision course with Earth. At a size of 10 metres, it's not quite going to be as visible as our moon and will only circle Earth once before continuing on its journey heading back out into the semi-emptiness on the 25th of November. This isn't the first time this has happened. In fact, one asteroid has actually been a short-time mini-moon for Earth twice, back in 1981 and then in 2022. The researchers behind the release of this information have also assured that the object is unlikely to be a piece of space debris, as its path suggests it has a natural origin. Despite its small size and brief visit, this is still a very fun piece of news to remind us that we are just a very small part of a very active universe. Also in the recent news about our planet's ancient past, new research has revealed that the Great Dying, the worst mass extinction event in the history of life on Earth, was instigated by Mega El Nino events, making things even worse for the organisms alive at the time. The Great Dying, which took place at the end of the Permian period about 252 million years ago, was a time of increased volcanic activity as the Siberian traps were erupting and injecting huge volumes of CO2 into the atmosphere. This resulted in rapid global warming that has long been recognised as playing a key role in the destruction wrought at the end of the Permian, but the extreme severity of the extinction, with an estimated 81% of marine species being wiped out, is still a bit of a mystery. Increased periods of volcanism resulting in rapid warming have occurred at multiple points in Earth's history, but none have ever approached the destructiveness of the end Permian extinction. So why was it quite so bad? Researchers have used paleoclimate models along with other techniques to investigate how ocean and weather systems would have been impacted, finding that sea surface temperature gradients broke down, ocean currents weakened, and much stronger and long-lasting El Nino events than we're used to today caused havoc on the Permian world. The increase in the occurrence of these wild weather events and the overall warmer conditions made it incredibly difficult for animals that couldn't quickly migrate across vast distances to survive, leading to the unusually high rates of extinction. This hypothesis also explains one of the other mysteries of the Great Dying, the different timings of the terrestrial and marine extinctions as the land was affected a few tens of thousands of years before the marine realm due to the prolonged droughts and heat waves, while the oceans warmed more slowly and so the extinctions occurred later. It's a fascinating new look at this terrifyingly disastrous period in our planet's history, as well as a sobering recognition of the impact that intensified El Nino events have on the biosphere. 
In slightly less ominous news, a new species of prehistoric thylacine relative has been named after Nigel Marvin. Thylacines, or Tasmanian tigers, were very dog-like marsupials that went extinct only in the 20th century, and paleontologists have named this new, much older species based on fossils found in northwestern Queensland that date to between 25 to 23 million years ago. Two other species of thylacine are named in this same paper, and together they are now some of the oldest thylacines known to science, indicating that these remarkable marsupials diversified earlier than realized. The species named for Nigel Marvin is called Angamalachinus nigel marveni, which the paper explains honors British television presenter and naturalist Nigel Marvin for his lifetime dedication to inspiring young paleontologists through his unique and daring style of presenting documentaries on ancient life. A very fitting tribute. This animal would have been about the size of a fox and had teeth perfectly suited to slicing through meat, indicating it was a hypercarnivorous thylacine. The biggest of the three new species, named Bajakinus timfalk neri, would have been about as large as a Tasmanian devil, and like them, had teeth suited to crunching bone. The third species, Nimbacinus peter bridgei, was the smallest, and was likely a generalist hunter of smaller mammals. All three species are known from fossil jaws and teeth, and their discovery shows that these amazing marsupials were already very diverse in their feeding styles at this point in time. Finally, this week's news includes the interesting discovery that a prehistoric bird, which looks like it should have been a predator of insects, was actually eating fruit. The bird species is called Longipteryx, which dates back to the early Cretaceous of China, about 120 million years ago. It's a pretty odd-looking animal with a very long snout and teeth right at the tips. This arrangement of the jaws and the anatomy of the large recurved teeth meant paleontologists had previously predicted that it was likely a specialized insect feeder. However, this new paper reports two new specimens of the bird with gymnosperm plant seeds preserved as stomach contents, indicating that Longipteryx was actually a frugivore, a fruit eater. It's a strange little twist in the development of our understanding of these birds and shows that tooth and snout anatomy alone cannot always be used to predict diet in these animals. This is especially true as the energy demanding activity of flight likely drove the evolution of complex diets in these early birds, and so paleontologists must be extra careful in interpreting their feeding ecologies. A very interesting study then. Well, that's it for this week's 7 Days of Science. Ben's finishing up his master's degree this week, so do be sure to send him your congratulations in the comments, and we're really excited to get to work on the channel and expand over the next year. I do hope you enjoyed this week's 7 Days of Science, and as always, we'll see you on Sunday.